What's up, Open Floor Globe? This is Michael the Pod Pina, and I'm joined on the other line by my good friend, Sports Illustrated staff writer Rohan Nadkarni. Rohan, how was your weekend? Can't complain, Mike. It was pretty good. Uh, you know, rolling into a solid Monday here. You know, Miami's turning into the football capital of the world. We got Mario Cristobal coming down to the U. We have the hottest team in the league, the Miami Dolphins, with the hottest quarterback in the league, Tua Tagovailoa. So, you know, I might have to pivot. I don't know how many more of these basketball pods I got in me with, you know, the football hotbed that South Florida is turning into. Um, yes, all of what you're saying is wonderful. The New England Patriots are in first place. Okay, so on today's show, we're going to open up the mailbag to answer a whole bunch of questions about a whole bunch of really interesting topics. But first, a quick reminder to keep those emails coming, openfloormail at gmail.com. That's openfloormail at gmail.com. Uh, Rohan, let's kick things off with an is email it, from Jared. Uh, did you, did oh, no, you hear no, the rumor? Yeah, go ahead. Did you hear the rumor that... Uh, people who email into the email address you mentioned are getting extra presents this holiday season because i heard a rumor that like a lot of people yeah. have been emailing in have been getting extra presents good fortune etc good things have been happening in their lives it's just interesting it's interesting what you hear you know the supply chain does not affect you <laughs> if you email into open floor breaking news everybody yeah, the loophole um, the loophole of the supply chain yeah that's the secret. That's the secret. The cheat code. Um, okay, so <laughs> let's kick things off with an email from Jared. And this is an email that you, <laughs> Rohan, have been begging to answer for weeks. So your answer better be tremendous. Jared writes, When Drew Holiday was on the trading block, I felt like he was a player that could have helped almost any team win the championship. He can fit anywhere. Example, if he had joined the Mavs, Nuggets, Jazz, Hawks, or Sixers last season, they all might have won the title. Who is this year's Drew Holiday? Fascinating question from Jared. Um, I have a guy who I want to talk about, but I know that you do as well, Rowan, so I'll let you kick this off. Well, I have a couple people, Mike. Uh, let me start here. This oh, is someone okay. who I've mentioned many, many, many times on this podcast and maybe even used this in exact introduction for him before. But, Mike, what if I told you there was a player out there with championship experience averaging 19 points and seven rebounds a game, shooting nearly 40% from three for almost the fourth or fifth season in a row now? Is that the type of player you may be interested in i yeah my ears would perk up I what if i told you this player was also lengthy could defend multiple positions uh could succeed on or off the ball does that someone who sound like someone who might fit in on a contender is he a good locker room guy i think he's a, a pretty well liked locker room guy I think that his contract is expiring pretty soon. It's not a long-term commitment. So you have the option to run it back with him because he's a fairly young player. Some would say he's in the prime of his career. Or, you know, you go all in for just uh, a short period of time. I think that this is a player that most teams would be interested in. Who is it, Rohan? Well, that player is Harrison Barnes of the Sacramento (laughs) Kings, a longtime favorite of the open floor podcast i i'm just curious when people are going to start really trying to turn the screws on the kings here obviously they've made a coaching change whatever their internal expectations are who knows they seem to be higher than the external expectations for them but it's barnes and then also buddy healed those are the two guys that i think contenders need to be targeting buddy healed was obviously mentioned a lot of trade rumors over the summer a lot of people thought the lakers were going to get him they went for Russell Westbrook and said, we see how that has turned out. I don't think mm-hmm. either of these guys are as good as Drew Holiday or as big of difference makers as Drew Holiday. Obviously, uh, he's someone no. who I think we, we, I believe we had in our top 30 in the top 100. I mean, Drew Holiday is a great player. But what I think we're seeing this season is there's just a little bit less concentration of power at the top this season. Now, granted, the, the Nets have been coming on strong. Milwaukee's looked incredible. When their top three guys are healthy, it's not that there aren't favorites in the league, but I don't think you need a player as great as Drew Holiday to significantly impact your title odds this season. Now, could you imagine if the Nuggets, I don't think that it's possible for them, but if they somehow had Harrison Barnes right now, obviously with MPJ out, 
Um, I, I think that even the Mavs, if he goes back to Dallas, could use him. If, if, if the Clippers somehow swung a trade for him, you mentioned the Jazz as a team needing to make a move. I know he's not quite the perimeter stopper you think they need, but I, I think he does improve them a little bit on the wing, gives them some more lineup flexibility. I think he's exactly the kind of guy every contender could use in the playoffs. Because as I mentioned, I mean, he's going to shoot threes. I mean, he could anchor some kind of second unit groups if you take your number one star out. Uh, let him get you some offense in those few minutes when you're star resting in the playoffs. He can play off the ball. He's hitting threes. I know a lot of people's last memory of him is missing some threes in the 2016 finals. He's improved as a lot as a shooter since then. Wait, that's their that's their last memory? Did I, these pe- Are these people been in a coma? Uh, I, how many people were watching <laughs> the Harrison Barnes-led Mavericks? Or how many people are watching the current oh, game, yeah, Sacramento baby. Kings? So I, I think that uh, I think that he can help a lot of teams. I mean, I 100% agree. I have a Harrison Barnes stat for you. There are five players in the NBA who are averaging more free throws per game than Harrison Barnes. Giannis, Jimmy Butler, DeMar DeRozan, James Harden, and Kevin Durant. Wow. So... In addition to everything that you cited, his ability to get to the line this year at a career-high rate is just humongous. Um, And, yeah, I mean, you laid out the case pretty wonderfully. He's shooting threes well. He's, I mean, he added the step back earlier this season. He hasn't really been taking too many of those lately. I, I think that I wonder sometimes about the drag of, being in a situation like the one he's in in Sacramento, what that has on performance, even though he's a tip-top professional, and I'm not mm-hmm. saying that it's negatively impacting him, but you know the players around him, the, the lineups that he's in, players like him are only better um, when surrounded by better players. Mm-hmm. So you throw him on, yeah, you put him next to Jokic, I think that would be a terrific fit. You put him, I, I mean, the, the player who I would love to see traded, who... I'm going to pivot to right now is Jeremy Grant, very similar to Harrison Barnes in a lot of ways. Um, a little bit more of an independent shot creator. He's also getting in the line quite a bit. He ranks 10th in the NBA in free throw attempts per game, uh, tied with Bam Adebayo, actually. And the, I, I, you know, I wrote, we did a roundtable last week where we talked about trades that we want Western contenders to make. And I want the Jets to either acquire Harrison Barnes or Jeremy Grant. I just think that that would vault them into a different level of just like a higher tier of of versatility and adaptability and just make them that much more uh, dangerous in a postseason setting and less predictable, too. And, yeah, like... Jeremy Grant just fits, along with Harrison Barnes, I think they're very similar players. They just fit everywhere. You mm-hmm. could slide them into almost any rotation in any role. Jeremy Grant was that guy who was acquired by the Denver Nuggets a couple seasons ago. And he played and, great for them. And he played really well. He was he was pretty solid in that series, or throughout the playoff run in the bubble. But um, even in that series against the Lakers that they eventually lost, that they easily could have won. I think people forget how competitive that series was. Anthony Davis had a buzzer beater to win one of the games. Um, but Jeremy Grant was really solid there. He's not hitting the three ball um, very accurately this season. But again, you look at the players who are around mm-hmm. him and the shots that he's taking, and it's just like he's – I don't think that that's really a, a true sign of his – I don't think he's this inefficient is what I'm trying to say. Like he's – He's just a really perfect player for today's league as a supporting member. Like he's not he's he's I think he's acquitted himself fine enough in terms of the numbers that he's accrued as the first option in Detroit, but right now with Cade Cunningham being kind of like the primary ball handler and Killian Hayes kind of coming on when healthy as a really um, intriguing player who I think they th- they should give some time and some opportunity to. Like, Jeremy Grant just doesn't really fit there anymore. So let's get Jeremy Grant on a very good team and have him elevate that team to being a potential champion. That's a great point. I think that's a great pick. And I think something we're both kind of hinting at is, if you think about Aaron Gordon, who is, was in a similar position to Jeremy Grant when he was on the Magic, right? At least Jeremy Grant last season, where they're asking him to be the number one option. It's not really working. You see flashes of it. But as soon as he gets to Denver, he becomes a totally different player and way more useful because he's in the right role for himself. Instead of asking him to kind of bat one spot higher in the order, you're asking him to bat one spot lower. 
and his whole life changes from there. And I think if you get guys like Harrison Barnes or Jeremy Grant, you ask them to do less. You actually get more out of those players uh, because they're not worried about inefficiency or volume, etc. I also want to check in, Mike, on a on a take that I ran by you on a different show mm-hmm. that we do a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I just want to make sure I I told you the the Warriors were the most dangerous team in the West about a month yes. ago. Now you told me the Jazz were more dangerous. I just want to I just want to double back to that. Get a check. Get a temperature check on you. How you feel about that? Um, are you willing to jump off the boat of your take now, or do you want to go down with the ship? I feel tremendous. <laughs> One point victory in Cleveland on Sunday. Let's go, uh, Rudy Gay at the five in that game. Just a lot of intriguing stuff going down in Utah. So, no, I'm 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 still loving the Utah <laughs> Jazz, and um, I will admit that I I would love to see them make a move uh, before the <laughs> trade deadline. That would be very helpful. Jordan Clarkson, I I don't recall seeing him make a three this season. So, <laughs> uh, you know, there's some room for improvement there. But um, but no, I mean, ob- obviously the Warriors have been red hot, and you were not wrong in what you said. But, you know, sometimes <laughs> both people can be right, Rohan. That's okay. Oh, okay, okay. Interesting. It's a long yeah. season. It's a long season. Exactly. So uh, let's go to this email from Thaddeus, who writes, um, I've had a question I think is fun that I've been mulling over. Who is the worst player who could lead a contender in scoring? This doesn't mean he's their best player. And I'll say my bar for contender is that you guys think they would avoid the play-in. Um, so, so, so Thaddeus mentions... Definition of contender. Yeah, very loose. My definition of a contender is a team I think can win the championship. Agreed, yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. So, but Thaddeus mentions, and granted, to, to Thaddeus' credit, there are a lot of teams like that this season. I mean, um, maybe any team in the top six can win the title. I don't know. But Thaddeus mentions DeMar DeRozan as a likely candidate here, leading the leading scorer for the Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls have been playing tremendous basketball. And I guess we can just... Like, why wouldn't we call them a contender? You know, like, yeah, I, I think the Bulls are a contender. It seems weird, I mean. but like, sure, just let's call yeah. them a contender. Um, I, mean, I think if we're played looking, well, they've played well against good teams. Yeah. I think I think we have to at this point admit the Bulls are a contender. Yes, the Bulls yeah. are a contender. The yeah. Bulls are back. Yeah. So I think if we're looking at this season and these rosters, like that's a fair enough thing to say about Demar. Even though I love him, um, this is like an extreme I, I, backhanded compliment. I think we could do worse than Demar. I think we could do worse than Demar. So I was looking through all the teams, and DeMar, it was tough to come up with someone who is quote-unquote worse than DeMar, but I found someone, another player who technically isn't leading his team in scoring right now, but could conceivably do so before the season is over. Mm -hmm. He plays for a contender. I believe, Rohan, that you told me at one point you were considering getting his face tattooed on your back. Um, It is Tyler Hero. Oh, he has okay. scored. He has scored forty-five more total points than Jimmy Butler this year, but he's averaging two point four fewer points per game, and it's conceivable that like, would you disagree when I say, like, in three months, Tyler Hero could easily be the leading scorer on the yeah, Miami Heat, and they point. could yeah. still be a contender. Yeah, no, that's a good pick. I was going to say Jason Tatum. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a tricky one because it's like it's not like a worst team. It's like who's the v- worst player? He's not going to lead the team in scoring, but does it have to be their own team? Right? You know what I mean? Like could mm, Nikola Vooch? So, like could Vooch be the leading scorer on a quote unquote team that was in the top six in either conference? Well, he could for sure. But contender, I I don't see... Like, Vooch right now, we just talked about the Bulls for like two seconds, and he's not their leading scorer. I know, but I, I just took this question, I guess, like a little bit more theoretical in terms of like all the players no, sure. in the league, if they were the number one scoring option, could they finish in the top six? So yeah, that's... So and, I, you know, right, so I'm ending up on guys like Vooch, Tobias Harris... Maybe. Um, Maybe. Thaddeus, Thaddeus actually uh, uh, threw out Kristaps Porzingis 
in his email also as another potential I honestly don't. candidate uh, here. Yeah, I don't see that one. <laughs> Wait, so you're going Tobias Harris and Vooch, but no no KP? KP's a bucket getter, man. I'm out on KP. I, I know he's been better this year, but I, I'm out on KP. I'm sorry. Wow. Here's, a, here's, I think, the spiciest one I have. Okay. Could Mikhail Bridges be the number one scorer on a team that was top six in either conference? That's absolutely ludicrous. I'm sorry. No uh, chance? I love Mikhail no Bridges. There's, zero, there's, there's a 0% chance there. I'm sorry. That's just not who he is in the NBA. But just he's like, got he's... a little juice. He's got a little juice. I think he could run some pick and rolls. It was like the year, granted, this team finished out of the playoffs, so take it with a massive grain of salt. But there was that year mm-hmm. the Heat just kind of like turned the offense over to Josh Richardson, and it had yeah. mixed results. And I think Mikhail Bridges is a better player than him. He's so if Mikhail Bridges was the leading scorer on a team, as opposed to the he's like the fourth maybe the fifth option right now on the Suns and no one he like his buckets are almost entirely created by the attention that I'm not that disagreeing Devin I'm not Chris disagreeing Paul. I'm just saying it's uh I said it was a spicy one I didn't say it was a bland one It's it's pretty spicy um what about Pascal Siakam I think he is like too qualified for this discussion So you think that's interesting, and we have an e- we have an email that we're going to get to at some point. Was, that I did was not he not put the leading scorer on the on the twenty twenty Raptors? On the twenty twenty Raptors, the bubble I season. I believe he would have. Yeah, I believe yeah. he would have been. So I, their I just think scorer. he's like. I think yeah. he's like overqualified for this discussion. That team was so okay. close to making the conference finals. I know, and then they got dominated by the Celtics in Game Seven. So <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. Sorry. Just humiliated, really. Yikes. Um, interesting enough, uh, OG Ananobi is actually Toronto's leading scorer this season. Okay. Not Pascal, who is third well, behind Pascal Fred Pascal has not, not played that too much. So. Van Vliet's another no. interesting answer to this question. He is. And I, I mean, the fact that, like, again, like, I don't think that if, the, if, if he were a leading scorer on a team, I just don't think that that team would be very good and we're kind of seeing that right now with Toronto. Toronto is not very good and he is I think I think Fred Van Vliet is probably their best player this season, mm. if not obviously their best player. So it's a really interesting question and you can get very theoretical with it as you were yeah. saying. Let's go to this question though, this email from Christine. And this is not theoretical. This is just um explicit and I love this question. <laughs> okay, all right. Christine parental, writes... St- parental advisory st- <laughs> recommended, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, earmuffs. Steph Curry has obviously been balling again this season, but how many of these awards do you see him getting? This was a MVP, good question. MVP, All-Star, All-Star MVP, Scoring Champion, Finals MVP. I'm setting the over-under at 2.5 That's for these five... That's such a good question. ...quote awards. So... Okay, Rohan. So I I I know where I'm going here, but I want to throw it to you first to kind of pick your brain because this is a fascinating one. List them all out again for me. It's MVP, Finals MVP, MVP. Finals MVP, Scoring Champion, All Star MVP, and then him just making the All Star team, which is definitely going to be one yeah. of them. <laughs> this was a really good question. And it's, I mean, she said the over under beautifully because I, there's two that I'm confident in. <sighs> there's two. Okay. So all stars, uh, like, I thought of um, even erasing it from the exercise. Space, yeah. <laughs> we should have put, yeah. I mean, but all NBA was also a all stars, a shoe in. I think he's going to win the scoring title. I think he's going to win the scoring title. Okay. So that's two. The problem with so All Star Game MVP one? is that it's like it could be anyone. It doesn't. It's not going to go to like you know. Like didn't Paul George win it that one year? Like it could just go to anyone who has a hot night on the night when no one cares. The real to me the sure. I guess you got to ask yourself who should care. 
Because that's usually who kind of wins. Like, I remember when Westbrook won. I think won. Steph's too old to care. I think Steph's too old to care. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, okay, really, so we're giving all, all, all stars the, the... We know all stars in there. I'm trying to see right space. now if he's... If he's ever been, I don't think he's ever been an all-star MVP, Steph, in his career. He's not been a finals MVP in his career. Um, he has been a scoring champion uh, twice in yeah. his career. And right now, I believe he's third in scoring behind KD and Giannis, if I'm not mistaken. Um So that's on the table as well. Yeah. And then there's... MVP. So, okay, let's talk. Let's talk about. Let's talk about MVP. MVP is the most interesting one on this on this thing because th- that's been a great race already, and Giannis is making a push now. I think Giannis is going to win MVP. I'm gonna I don't think he's going to win. I don't think he's going to win. Okay. I think he's Good maybe argument. already missed too much time. <laughs> what are you, dude? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? I think him. I, I let me take that back. He hasn't missed too much time. I think the. The Bucks' slow start has already maybe knocked him out. Um, my counter to that is that the Bucks' slow start is proof and indicative of his value to the team. Yes, but that's just never how these votes go. It just never is. If they they cannot finish seven games behind Golden State, and he he's going to win. I don't think that's going to happen. So when Giannis won MVP. The on-off point differential, the net on-off point differential, his first year was uh, 8.8 points per 100 possessions. And basically, Mm -hmm. this is just the difference between when he's on versus when he's off. And you just add those two Mm -hmm. figures together and you get the second year was 12.7. These are like massive numbers, very impressive numbers. (laughs) With Jokic, Um, was at like 39.4 at one point this year, which was really insane. Yeah, it was high this year. Yeah. Right now for Giannis... 8.8 8.8 first MVP, 12.7 second MVP. Right now it's 23.7. And when he's on the floor, they're plus 13.6, which is just, I don't even know what to say about it. Um, and the thing that separates, real quick, about Giannis, the thing that always separates him in these conversations where you're like, okay, so offensively, we're kind of splitting hairs here in terms of mm-hmm. his impact and his efficiency, and we're splitting hairs between him and Steph and KD and blah, blah, blah. And then you're just like, okay, defense, what's going on there? And it's just like, okay, well, this guy is maybe mm-hmm. the second or third or first best defender in the world. So um, Tell me, tell me his on-off there. differential one more time. 23.7 okay. points per 100 possessions. He's beating Steph, who's at 16.8. According to cleaning the glass, I, I'm not saying he doesn't have a case. I just think that it's not. It as we all know, it doesn't just come down to who has the best case. Like it's always a weird mix of case numbers, narrative, etc. Mm-hmm. And team record is also a factor. And I just think that if the Warriors are like the number one seed and we're the number one seed the entire season, I think Steph's going to win. So I'm going to go over. I'm going to go over for the question. Okay, so which ones are you... You're saying all-star, you're saying scoring champion, and you're saying MVP are the yes. three that, that put you over the top? Yes. Okay, so... I'm also... I think I'm also going over... I think... Man, this is so hard. It's just, this is... I, Christine, I mean, we... This is... Last week we had the Christine. You're an evil genius. Yes, is basically this is, the. This is a kind of like parlor game you like you would play with your friends, and this is perfect. Like this is absolutely perfect. The, we we got the question last week about the five man defensive lineups. This is another absolute fastball. I love this question. It's so good. But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna confirm lock in over. Okay, so. I think All Star MVP. I can always see Steph winning because. If he wants to win, like it's always on the table for him because mm-hmm. no one's going to guard him. And he's just remember last year when him and Dame were just shooting those logo threes, and it was like the most thrilling thing you've ever seen. And then there's NBA writers complaining like no one's trying hard enough in this game. <laughs> I can't believe I'm watching it. <laughs> yes, I agree. Those people yeah. stink. Um, yeah. So I can see him winning that. Uh, 
I can frankly see like look, scoring champion, he's not in first right now, and Clay's gonna come back. So how would that how will that impact things in I that mean, category? It will impact, but I mean it's not like he hasn't dominated before with Clay in the lineup. Like what if that makes him score even more? Like that could cut either way. It's no that very fair. Yeah. Very, very fair. Um I think Finals MVP is the one we haven't really talked about, yeah. and that's like if they win the finals, he's I, gonna win MVP this time. No, I th- yeah, I think I think like if they get to, yeah, if they win the fi- I will say if they win the finals, I think it'll be very difficult, almost regardless of how he plays. Exactly. Yes, he will the, win MVP if they win the finals. No, it's question. just eleven. It's eleven media members, I believe. Yeah. Uh, look, like even if his numbers aren't there, we all know now six seven years into this that when he's on the floor is the attention Iguodala, that he draws just enables the, everything that happens was iguodala the worst finals mvp they've given out in i don't know modern nba history not that i don't love Andre, so when you say worst do you mean like most um, egregious like, not worst player like most egregious most egregious okay um hmm very interesting question uh Okay, so I have a few. I'm just going to go off the top of my head here because okay. I, I have a few. Uh, 2010, Pau Gasol was the finals MVP over Kobe Bryant. Anyone who watches that series, I'm sorry. That's just – it's just a fact. Um, 2007. Okay. 2007, was Tim Duncan – Tony Parker won, yeah. and Tim Duncan was on the team, and he was like <laughs> probably the best player in the world. It's right. just like, what yeah. is happening? Yeah. Um, those are two off the top of my head. Uh, some people will say Anthony Davis over LeBron in 2020. I think I do. I'm now coming back to LeBron. Should have won it. Wait a minute. Didn't LeBron... LeBron won. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You're right. What am I saying? What am I saying? No, no. But I think some people think LeBron should have lost to Anthony Davis. Yes, that is correct. Anthony yeah. Davis was the best player on the team, and he should have been the finals MVP. But I don't think so. I think I came back around <laughs> okay. to LeBron on that one. Yeah. Okay. That's fair enough. LeBron is awesome. Um... I'm trying to think of there are any other. But I mean, it, really like Steph should have won it, and then second place should have been LeBron. It should have been Steph and LeBron in the 2015 finals. Twenty Steph. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, I think I'll, I'll go LeBron in that one personally. I just think what he did. Yes, I agree. Um, I with want everybody him to out. Win. Yes, I think that if if a player should ever win Finals MVP. Jerry West won it once, I believe. Mm-hmm. If it should ever happen again, it should have happened to LeBron that year. Absolutely. Um, Do you think LeBron would funny... accept one less ring if he had won that Finals MVP? Because that's kind of a cooler <laughs> feather in your cap, isn't it? Kind of a nice subtle jab at Steph to have that one over him if he had won that one award that year. It is. Yes, that would be. Um, Amazing, and Can I don't we, know if he would sacrifice the ring for it, but it would have been well, not the 2016 one, but he would have maybe sacrificed the 2021. I want to look up. Can I don't want to? Should we maybe shame the voters who voted for Iguodala that year? I'm sure we can no, find out. We should. <laughs> we, we should not do that. Um, and I mean, Iguodala's case was. In, this is why Iguodala should not have won, in my opinion. His case was entirely predicated on he guarded LeBron, <laughs> Guard LeBron and like LeBron, LeBron went off. Yeah. So I know. I mean, I know LeBron wasn't efficient, but but like, was, Matthew Della Vadova was the think, second best player. Right, I don't even think LeBron was trying to be efficient as much as he was trying to pound the shit out of the basketball and like shoot at the end of the shot clock every time. They're like, it's in God's hands now, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, this is just uh, this is what great questions do yes, to this send you, podcast. Okay. Okay, but I'm going to, I have the, so here's the crazy part is uh, Steph didn't get a single vote for finals MVP. Really? Yeah, it was Iguodala 7, LeBron James 4. I'm just going to read out who voted who, okay? We don't have to. We okay, don't have to we do not. No, no. We, we, don't, we need don't need to slander anybody. No, we're not going to slander anybody on the show. I'm sorry. We can't do that. Okay, um, but can, can I? Can we shout out the people who voted LeBron? Can we do that? Can we do that? Sh- sure, sure. Shout sure. out to shout out to these people: Steve Ashburner, NBA.com, LeBron James, Jeff Van Gundy, LeBron James, uh, Zach Lowe, LeBron James, and how about our good buddy Howard Beck, then of Bleacher Report, LeBron James? 
on the right side of history okay. all of you good okay. call i love that that's yeah. wonderful um i wish yeah. lebron won that final MVP. steph didn't even get a single vote that was that was clearly without shaming people i think people that shows how much the conversation around the sport has changed in the last five years six years because that wouldn't happen again today because it the fact that none of the voters voted Steph, I think, was like showed how little grasp there was kind of broadly yet about analytics and his impact because it's insane that he didn't get a single vote. Do you think if that exact finalist played today, you know, what you just said about things kind of changing a little bit, do you think LeBron would have won? I think Steph would have won and I think the vote would have been tighter. Would have been like Steph six five. I feel like we could just have a finals MVP. This is yeah, we'll we save this for the offseason. because now we I'm could, I'm down yeah. I'm Can down like do, a rabbit hole right now looking at all of the yeah, finals MVPs. Uh, just talking about the finals in general. Oh my god! And like those series are crazy. I also I also want to make a request of uh, our producer Shelby. I feel like we should start keeping track of some of the predictions we make on this show just to revisit at the end of the year and have some fun with it. Like we unnecessary. Let's put, no, I don't think we <laughs> not to roast each other, but just to see how we did. Like we should put a pin in the Steph over under one, and then see where we ended up at the end of the year. We should just do a year in review. No, pod I like after that. the season ends. No, I like that a lot, and that kind of honestly, I can tie that into our next question. From it's an email from Abdul. Before we get into the next writes, question, can I throw one more thing at you? Sure. Right now, which two teams do you want to see in the finals? Which two teams do I want to see in the finals? Yeah. Thunder and Celtics. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, which team do I want to see in the finals? I would say... I want to see Kawhi Leonard come back, and I want the Clippers to look right. I want the Clippers to make the finals um, in the West, and I think that that would be a lot of fun, and the Western Conference playoffs would be totally bonkers if he came back. And looked right. Um, if not him, you know, I I do have a soft spot for the Utah Jazz. I would love to see them break through, and maybe it isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily have to be. Can you pick a, a final appearance? series, Mike? Can you pick a final series, Mike? Just two teams. You listed okay. four teams already. Just give me two Clip- teams. <laughs> Clippers and. Hawks. Let's go Clippers and Hawks. That's the finals I want right now, okay. today, on December 6th. Okay. Terrible pick. Do you have an answer to that question? Yeah, Do you have man. an answer? Yeah, man. Warriors okay. Bucks. Warriors Bucks. Okay. That's that would be cool, I guess. For I sure. wanna see I wanna see the old dynasty try to knock off one that's emerging. I wanna see teams like headlined by two stars on like opposite poles of the star spectrum. Where you have Steph and Giannis who play completely different games. It, it would uh-huh. it would just be incredible. It would be incredible. It would be great. I agree. Um, okay, so Abdul has been sitting on his hands patiently <laughs> waiting for me to read his email. Um, Abdul writes, hey guys, long time listener here. Open Floor was actually the first podcast I ever listened to back in 2015. Seeing it thrive through the years and grow just as I've grown has been awesome. Let's talk about the real most improved player who won't get any national attention because of stats, because of counting stats, I guess. (laughs) It's it's John Collins. I understand that national people don't watch the Hawks and the national people who do watch the Hawks only do it to see how many free throws Trey gets. But someone (laughs) has to know this. John Collins is the story of this Hawks season. He's so unbelievably good. I walked out of a game last week where he only had 11 points and Trey had 30, but Collins was by far the best player on the floor from buzzer to buzzer. He got a bag this summer, and instead of slacking off, he came back and is having the best season of his career. He's a menace on the defensive end, a 99th percentile finisher in the pick and roll, got a legitimate three ball, and now after getting his $125 million contract, he's added playmaking skills that rank him as an 89th percentile playmaker wow. as a big man per b-ball index. Abdul, bravo to you for the advanced stats in this yeah, email. Very, well very uh, impressed you. Uh, Abdul continues, this guy hustles, does all the dirty work, and is the vocal and emotional leader of the Hawks. He should be an all-star this year, and he truly should be getting some or any love for most improved player. 
to go from the 19th pick, whose only talent was jumping and dunking, to one of the most well-rounded two-way big men in today's game is an incredible achievement. So, my question here off of this email, um, which was very wonderfully researched and impressive by Abdul, is, and I want to say real quick, I think this ties back to what you were saying earlier, Rohan, about um, you know going back to our preseason predictions and one of the interesting ones that I was looking at when we did our roundtable for SI.com was most improved player, because I want to say who actually mm-hmm. leapt forward yeah. and who didn't. So we'll get into that in a second. But just let's, let's quickly just uh, e- answer Abdul's um, point blank question here. Is, is John Collins the most improved player in the league right now for you, Rohan? Well, first of all, Abdul, love the passion. Thank you for taking shots at the national guys like Mike and I. We need people keeping <laughs> us humble. Um, I don't think he's the most improved player, but that's not because I don't think he's been great. I've always been high on John Collins. It was insane to me that there was like a stretch at the beginning of last season. We were like, is Atlanta going to trade this guy? Um, you know, he might not, they might not re-sign him long term, etc. That never really made sense to me. I, mm-hmm. I thought we saw maybe not as consistent. I mean, obviously, it's different over the regular season, but I thought we saw the idealized version of John Collins during the playoffs. And I don't know that he's been so much better than that guy. So I guess what I'm saying is I was already, I had such a high floor, high opinion of John Collins that I'm not, I'm not looking at it as a guy who's taken a leap. I'm, I'm looking at it as a, this is an extension of the guy we saw in the postseason just kind of continuing to thrive, continue to be at that level. I mean, I really liked him. Uh, he's such a unique player in that he works so well as a power forward, you know, quote unquote, if you want to use that term. So, so great playing the four because he can space the floor alongside a big like Clint Capella, or he can play the five, you know, work out of the short role. If people trap Trey, uh, he can be a vertical threat. He can be a spacing threat, versatile defender. I, I thought we saw all of that in the postseason. So, I don't think, I hope I'm not sleeping on John Collins. I don't want to take away from the strides that he's made, but I, I've seen this as more of like a extension than, than kind of that classic leap season where I don't want to sound like a homer, but can you really say if you want to chart, you know, improvement season to season, it's hard to argue that like there have been players more improved than say Tyler Hero or Miles Bridges who've kind of taken these really big leaps in multiple areas of their game. Whereas I think John Collins like, found this success in the postseason and is like building off of that right I, I think john collins is awesome he's one of my favorite players to watch he dunked so hard on cody martin last night that caleb martin started to shiver <laughs> he's he's fourth in so 538 has this catch-all raptor stat um and their raptor wins above replacement metric um, has him fourth right now. And the three players above him are Giannis, Steph, and Jokic. So obviously he's doing something right in the eyes of um, people who are watching the Hawks play. The on-off numbers are ridiculous. He's hitting 48% of his above-the-break threes. He's doing all the stuff that Abdul, you mentioned, Rohan, that you mentioned, all the little stuff. Um, but in terms of like the whole league and who's the most improved... I can't say that John Collins is in that tier, mm-hmm. really. Uh, Which is a testament a to how of... good he's been in his career. He's just a really good player. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think I think the the more fascinating way to look at this and frame this is is John Collins an all star? Yes, that and is the question. That's what we're going to have to talk about as we get closer to February or closer to when all star teams are announced. And I think there will be a case. Mm-hmm. And before the season, I remember I, I said, I think I told this story on the pod before, but when I was down in Atlanta doing my story for SI, I asked, you know, almost everybody that I talked to or everybody that I talked to, is there a second all star on this team? And, uh, you know, behind Trey, who is the second all star? And everyone was just like, Kevin you know, Herter. Everybody was like, hey, like, you know, um, we just have like a bunch of 
potential candidates and you know deandre hunter looks good cam mm. Reddish looks good uh clint capella's great john collins is awesome ever no one would would pin down exactly one mm. player and when i asked john collins the question he just said uh, it's got to be me and i was like <laughs> you are <laughs> yeah you're an absolute icon i love you um there was a great so he's great yeah he's great uh i just want to shout out because it's funny that we we're talking about john collins i was i think i saw this this morning or last night but sam Esfandiari, who hosts uh, the Light Years podcast, Warriors podcast, we did this play out. But uh, it was just a great play of the Hawks running a high pick and roll. Capella's on the floor. Collins is in the corner. And he just makes a great cut to the rim, gets a dunk. And you talk about little things. I mean, that's the thing that it, the cut, um, it might show up in an advanced stat, doesn't show up in the box score, um, doesn't show up in terms of how much pressure he puts on a defense, etc. Guys like that are so valuable, especially come playoff time. We saw it with Aiton, these players who can kind of put pressure on defenses in multiple ways and kind of leverage the defense's attention even when they don't have the ball are, are so valuable. Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about John Collins is whether he has the ball or doesn't, he demands their attention. That helps all their shooters and all their perimeter players. Right. So I guess going back again to – our preseason predictions. Who did you have for most improved player? Do you I have remember? No Rohan? idea. I have no idea. I was kind of. I thought you'd have it <laughs> on you, considering you went back and looked at it. <laughs> no. Clue. Okay. Why don't you? Can you do me a favor and look it up while I tell you about? Um, so you you looked it up. You well, you looked up the si dot com article and you said, "Let me not even." I did check who Rohan had. No, well, I, I'm, I'm sure I glanced and I, I looked at it, but this was like Saturday night at like um, or like early Sunday morning at like 2 a.m. when I was doing this. So, um, and I was I had just watched uh, the Spurs uh, Warriors game, and I was like, did I have Dejounte Murray as my my most improved player pick? I think I did. I hope I did because <laughs> did I think Dejounte have, Murray you had is Trey going Young to win this award. <laughs> We don't need to talk about that, okay? That's I picked Jokic, which was a brilliant stroke of genius. Okay, so getting back to most improved player. Um, I had DeJounte Murray. I think DeJounte Murray is the most improved player in the league. And I think that this 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 award is so funny just because, you know, we debate it all the time. Like, how much should context matter? How much should experience and age matter? You know the Spurs lost Demar Derozan. We saw we're seeing we're seeing now how impactful Demar Derozan is on an offense. And I knew coming into the season that Dejounte would be their primary ball handler, and he's in some ways like he hasn't really improved his efficiency, but a lot of the numbers are up in a big way without turnovers going up, by the way, which is really impressive. And, I mean, he's averaging, like, 19, 9, and 9. Like, it's just, like, that's such something that you don't see, giving all defensive-level defense. So he's my pick. He was my pick then. He's my pick now. Um, Miles Bridges, you mentioned, has looked great, even though his three-point shooting's fallen off a little bit. He'll, he's probably the clubhouse favorite to win this award, I would say. And I wanted to shout out one other player, and I hate rewarding first to second year leaps because I just don't, I don't think that they, like, you're supposed to improve. That's just, like, what it is. So I don't like doing that. But Tyrese Maxey is making the type of leap that's just, like, what is even happening? Um, so he he's the rare case. And a few years ago, Devontae Graham was in this category for me where it was just, like, what, it, love what is even Graham. going on? Yeah. Right. So Tyrese Maxey is another guy who I want to just quickly mm. um, shout out. There's a lot of candidates. I just don't think that John Collins quite cuts into that top tier. Can I tell you who I picked? Because it's pretty embarrassing. Please it's do. It's embarrassing. I'm glad I picked this player, and I, I still have high hopes Wait, for Wait, can them. I guess? I, prom- I promise I have not looked it up. Can okay. I guess? Yeah. Was it Jordan Poole? No, which would have been a sick Okay. Pick. I'll give you two more who guesses. Who was it? I have no other guesses for you. I picked Jaron Jackson Jr., <laughs> which I think is an expi- inspired pick. Doug, he's he's looked great recently has, since John Morant went down. He has. He's not going to have the counting stats for it. Like he's not even averaging a career high in points technically. But I really like Jaron Jackson Jr. Like, you know, if they'd kept up their team success and he really balls out as long as John Morant's out, maybe he can sneak into the conversation. I don't know that Memphis, outside of Jaw, is ever going to get the national attention. He needs to win the award, but I love JJJ, man. 
and I'm glad he's at least been healthy enough to play this year. Trip, yeah, he's he's fantastic. He's looked really good. Memphis is like the most dominant team in NBA history since John Moran <laughs> went down, which is pretty interesting. Um, Mike, do you watch? Uh, do you like watching inside the NBA, like after the TNT games? I I genuinely do. Yes, actually, well, you know what? Let me let me let me say I. It, it kind of sometimes depends on what else is going on, mm-hmm. like what the game was, how close the game was. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll say I I still love hearing that crew's opinions on things that are like big newsworthy items, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. So I do absolutely. watch it still. Yeah. Yes. No, I love the show. I absolutely love it. I love staying up late and watching it. I, for some reason, this just popped into my mind, but. Were you watching the other night when they were giving out... They were doing EJ's Neato Stat of the Night, the best segment on television. <laughs> and, like, worth staying up till one fifteen on the East Coast for. And they were doing, like... They were handing out, like, scarves from the Harry Potter houses. And, like, as usual, Shaq ruined the segment by, like, taking all the scarves for himself. But they... <laughs> They said, EJ's like, all right, this next house is Hufflepuff. And Barkley's like, Kenny, we know that's you. <laughs> every, like people on the, people on the set are laughing. You can hear you can hear people behind the camera laughing. God, that show's incredible. That's just a good show, man. It's so good. Was that is this leading anywhere? Or no, did you just nothing. I don't know why it little... popped into my head, but inside the NBA, man, it's people. My big issue is like people want it to fit their worldview. Like they want it to be this like advanced stats like great like understand three-point shooting but once you accept that it's like a television show with running plot lines and running jokes and it's like a years-long soap opera it becomes a much better watch it's no coincidence that it's won like an emmy every single year it's the best studio show in the history of north american professional sports agreed Okay, so I'm going to pivot. The only way I could follow that up, honestly, is with this week's segment of the Rip City Royston Report. And <laughs> when did, when did so it we're become gonna... the Rip City Royston Report? I thought it was just the Shelby, Rip City Report. No, Shelby Royston, our producer, loves alliteration, and he wanted to throw in Royston, and so that's going to be the new name it going looks... forward. <laughs> and, and honestly... Um, this week's segment is we're not even like trying to force this year because um, <laughs> the Portland Trailblazers are, are in the news and um, so Shelby Shelby are you with us right now okay perfect so I wanted I wanted to touch on a recent article published in the athletic that reported that Damian Lillard is interested in playing with Ben Simmons. Uh, Shelby, give us your thoughts on this report, this news, and just what's going on in Portland land. I mean, I, of course, uh, know he was interested, but now that he's saying it publicly, that's pretty big. I mean, he's (laughs) obviously not happy with how things are going this season. He's, play has been down, but, you know, he's, obviously wanting another playmaker in there <laughs> i guess we mm-hmm. say. are but, you a big are you a ben simmons guy shelby would you rather uh, have lou dort i would rather have lou dort but you know <laughs> we can't have everything but uh you know they already have shooters in like lillard obviously powell uh i guess Simons, if he wasn't included in the trade, so that's like mm-hmm. the problem with that Philly had last season. Like they don't have, mm-hmm. they didn't have as many, and then you don't have Simmons even attempting a shot from like less than five feet. So like, what do you? But like, I it would probably fit in with Portland. And then the other thing is, you would assume that CJ McCollum is going to have to go to Philadelphia or wherever if they were to acquire Ben Simmons. What is your fan from like your fandom what is your fandom relationship with CJ McCollum? Do you like CJ? Would it be sad for you if he left? I mean, I worry about that I mean it was headlines everywhere that he 
purchased the winery during the auction. <laughs> yes. Oregon is sort of its own wine country. <laughs> now he's going to be living in, uh, I'm guessing, New Jersey, maybe the Northern Liberties if he wanted to live in the city. He's going to be away from this thing. I mean, I wouldn't want to run a business like that from across the country. I mean, <laughs> he's he he's saying you have to consider. He may block. I don't know. He may enact some type of no trade. <laughs> he needs to be there, crushing those grapes. Okay. okay so okay, <laughs> he was... may enact some kind of. <laughs> okay. Back that was uh, like he might like you know they then spy movies they pour the the ink and like it's invisible ink yeah, I think he might have done that with his contract like pour the wine on there and it reveals that I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I cannot breathe. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. What an incredible loophole that you could invo- include in a contract. We put <laughs> invisible ink on the back. Oh, boy. Um, the Rip City Royston Report just keeps getting better and better. It's it's why people are subscribing in mass to Open Floor. Um, people... Uh-huh. There was another loophole in the Rip City report. What was that? You guys curb your enthusiasm, fans. Yes. I've seen a few episodes in my day. Did you see the second to latest episode? I have not seen anything from this season. Michael? I have not. I am actually trying to um, save them so Mm. that I can binge through at the same time. It's been difficult for me to have that type of patience, but I have not. Well, seen no, that episode no yet. spoilers, but in one scene, Larry David goes to Vince Vaughn's house. He's playing uh, Funkhauser's brother, I believe. Right. He, Funkhauser sits on the couch, turns on the TV, and playing in 2021 is like a 2015 regular season game <laughs> in Portland against the Clippers. Now, what channel on TV, even basketball related, is playing a regular season game from 20, like 15? They were wearing sleeves still. That was like a sleeve, short sleeve. Oh, that's, that was the tell. Oh, that that's how you yeah. knew. And you see the court's different. Blake Griffin was on the court. I'm noticing immediately. They don't think <laughs> they're going. They, you know, they, they, they think we're, I'm going to be locked in on this whole... Like uh, this argument about Perrier and Stan Pellegrino that Vince and Larry are having, but I'm locked into the TV. <laughs> I just want to know you, you couldn't have you couldn't have gotten like some generic footage. Why? Why was it? What was the choice to pick a game from seven years ago or so? Was what was the this, license? This is a f- truly fascinating question. We got to get to the bottom yeah. of this, frankly. <laughs> It's now my life's work yeah. to figure out how this happened. Mike and I do know first, that NBA uh, TV co by <laughs> line. Yeah, I mean, this should be a narrative podcast that spinoff yeah. for yeah. us, where we just try to figure out the answer to this question. It's, because it's, it's one and a half episodes long. It was just one phone call to HBO, and we figured it out. Yes, and then we yeah. were all fired. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's close today's show on the on the on the topic of Ben Simmons. We got a bunch of for some reason, honestly, I I don't know why, but this week we got a ton of emails about Ben Simmons and possible trade ideas, and we've obviously hit this topic very hard over the past few months. But I wanted to just you know let our emailers be heard. And so we're going to do just a quick thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm going to read a few um, trade ideas, abbreviated emails. And Rohan, I just want you to give me a quick thumbs up, thumbs down. Nothing crazy with your Mm -hmm. deep analysis. Um, (laughs) Our first one comes from, (laughs) our first one comes from uh, Kareem. A little bit of an insult. Okay. No, no, no. I'm I'm congratulating you on your knowledge. Um, Our first email comes from Kareem, who writes, I'm a lifelong Knicks fan, and obviously I'm traumatized by our lack of consistency. So here's the question. Please tell me if I'm totally spiraling or onto something. A trade package that involves Kemba 
and R.J. Barrett for Ben Simmons. Um, thoughts on that one? No chance for Philly you. Does. No Rohan. chance Philly does it. Zero. No chance Philly. Is there any package, real quick, that you can think of involving the Knicks and Ben Simmons? Like, would a Julius Randle Ben Simmons swap? Is that. I, I don't think that makes sense. I don't sense, think there's any I'm good fits on the Knicks roster for Philly. Fair enough. Our next email comes in from Chris, who writes, Hey, Chris, Michael, and I guess Rohan. Yeah, I saw Chris this email that one. What the hell? What the hell, Chris? What's up, man? Chris Chris writes, Chris clearly deserves a spot at the top for having such a cool name, so there he shall remain. I can't speak to what else, what why Chris does not like you, Rohan, but maybe Chris can email us back in. Chris is now. not a cooler um, name than Rohan, but okay. Uh, no comment. So, <laughs> the fake trade. Sixers receive Marcus Smart, Jeremy Grant, and a third contract, perhaps Dennis Schroeder. The Pistons receive two first-round picks, some combination of Boston's non-Rob Williams young guys and Danny Green's contract. Boston receives Ben Simmons. Rohan, what do you think about this one? Wait, this wait. is actually a pretty interesting The Celtics trade. are sending out Rob Williams and who? No, no, no. The Celtics are sending out... Keep up. Come on. What are you doing? The Celtics are sending out some combination of non-Rob Williams young guys, Marcus Smart, a third contract, perhaps Dennis Schroeder, and... You know, in this th- three-team configuration hypothetical, there are two first-round picks. I do not know where those are coming from, if they're coming from um, Philly or from Boston to Detroit. But I assume, since Boston is receiving Ben Simmons, that they would probably be giving up at least one of those first-round picks. So, what's your reaction here to this one? No. <laughs> who, are they, who is the, Just who a are no. The, who are the Sixers getting? Peyton Pritchard? Like Ro- Romeo Langford? This- the, the Sixers are receiving Marcus Smart, Jeremy Grant, and a third this contract. This is the first time you said Jeremy Grant's name in this trade. That, that, that name, is not true That the name did all. not come up at any other point during this question. I don't, I don't know. Are you are you doing are you online sports I don't betting know what while happened we're recording to me. this I podcast? I don't know what happened, but I don't think that one that <laughs> one seems a little too complicated. Too rich for my blood. I don't like it. Okay, good enough. Our last our last email comes in uh, from Michael, who writes, <laughs> Time to rev up the Ben Simmons trade rumors. There is an obvious one that hasn't been mentioned. Ben Simmons for Gordon Hayward. Simmons is six years younger and fits into the Hornets' timeline, and Hayward fits into the Sixers' title aspirations. Who says no? Uh, quickly, before you uh, answer this, Rohan, um, I mentioned this possibility multiple times on the show before the season began in a slightly different iteration where I had Miles Bridges going to Philadelphia with Hayward, and obviously that isn't happening now. So I want to thank Michael for bringing it up, and um, what are your thoughts on it? I like this one. It's interesting. I think Philly would want, want to get one more piece, squeeze the Hornets for one more piece there. Yes, yeah, I like that they trade. definitely would. I like that trade. I think that because of the age difference alone... Uh, yeah, Charlotte has to give up a first or maybe like Jalen McDaniels. I yeah. don't know. But they, it's not a straight up swap yeah. situation. Um, but that's an great. interesting So one. it is interesting. So that does it for today's show. Uh, thank you so much to you, Rohan. Thank you so much to our listeners for sending in Except Chris. all these wonderful emails. Um, Especially Chris. Uh, everyone, please keep them coming in to openfloormail at gmail.com. That's openfloormail at gmail.com. Everybody, please stay safe. Everybody, please continue to enjoy the NBA season. Let's go.